Now how are we going to apply that data? Once you have the test results, you have to know what they mean and how they apply to the specific component. And this is where having information about the sample or the equipment that that sample came from is very important. Quality data interpretation is uh, very de dependent on uh, the information provided. Uh, we look at the application. You know, are we talking about a mining application, a construction application, or a processing application? Because knowing the application, at least from an element standpoint, will affect what elements we might specifically look for, especially if we're talking about external contamination. If we have an application, a mining application where they're in a, a quarry, especially if it's a limestone quarry, we might look for calcium and look at it from a different perspective. If we start to see high amounts of calcium, even though it's an additive element, we know it's also something that is present in that limestone. And just knowing that application will affect the determination. We also need to know the equipment information. The more specific information we have about the equipment, the more specific the interpretation. At a minimum, we, what we want to see is the make and model. And from there, the equipment age. Again, you know, if we're looking at oil that's from a brand new piece of equipment, it's going to be in that break-in mode. So we might see higher amounts of wear elements, which is normal, especially, in, again, in break-in in break mode. Now, if we have that same type of equipment, and say it's about two, has two to three thousand hours on it, and we start to see high levels of wear that look like break-in. At this point, we know it's not, so it could be indica indicative of some type of a failure getting ready to occur. We also look at the lubricant information, the, the type, the grade, the specific product, as well, and it, as well as its age. And age becomes important when we start doing trending. You know, if we're looking at uh, the viscosity increasing, um, you know, it, if it starts to oxidize, it's very important to know how old it is. Is it oxidizing at a rate to where it's in increasing, you know, five or six points over 300 hours, or is it increasing over a thousand hours? Um, knowing this information can help determine how much longer it can last in the system. We also look at the maintenance performed. Was the oil changed? Was the filter changed at the time the sample was pulled? This just goes back to how we make recommendations as far as what needs to be done next. Um, sometimes if, inf if specific type of inf maintenance information is provided, such as um, a repair, we might see some residual uh, stuff like if there's a coolant leak, we might could see some residual coolant. But if we know that repair was made, we won't necessarily make a recommendation for additional maintenance. We also look at filter information. What type of filter? What size of filter? What's the micron rating? And this becomes important when we're looking, especially at the cleanliness levels. Um, it can make a determination as to whether or not that filter is working properly or whether the micron rating might need to be increased for that component. We also look at the sump size of the component overall. And the reason that matters is that you can have the same type of component. Say we're talking about a, a Caterpillar engine, um, a 3506. You know, if it's being used in an industrial setting where it's um, non-mobile, it will have a larger sump size as opposed to that same type of engine that might be used in a mobile application that will have a smaller sump. And what happens there, you know, when we're talking about a 10-gallon sump versus a 100-gallon sump, we still have that same size component that only has so much wear debris that it can generate. And if it's in a larger sump, we're going to look for a smaller amount or a smaller count of elements in parts per million as far as flagging it for an impending failure. Now, we're going to, I'm going to go into a little example of what we expect to see when we do flagging, just to give you an idea of how critical having this type of information is. Let's say we're looking at a transmission. If we know it's just a transmission, we're going to flag it at 217 parts per million of iron. If we know it's an automatic transmission, we might flag it at 149 parts per million. So the tolerance that we flag at gets a little tighter. If we know it's an Allison transmission, well, let's say what we know about Allison is that they generate a little bit more iron, so it's okay to have more iron and not have to worry. We might flag that 171 
parts per million. So you have a little bit more leeway. But let's say we know that that Allison transmission is an HT754CR. Knowing that specific model, we now know that we're going to flag it at 68 parts per million of iron. So that tolerance and flagging just got a lot tighter. So by not knowing that information, if we just knew that that Allison HT transmission, if we only knew it was a transmission in general, there is a very wide range of parts per million that could have been generated that could have caused a failure to that component by not knowing that particular information. So now we're going to go into some of the maintenance strategies. Um, you know, we're, we've talked about how to apply the data, so now we're going to take that data and send it into some kind of a maintenance strategy. You know, we're talking about maintenance and strategies in the oil analysis. We can confirm, first off, that we have the component properly lubricated. We're going to be able to determine that the additive packages are within specification. We're going to be able to identify lubricant mixing and allow scheduled downtime for maintenance and repairs. Those should be some of the key things that we do with oil analysis. Because any time that we can uh, confirm this information, we can extend the life of the component. So taking this information, we can go into a condition-based maintenance strategy. And this is going to require some advanced testing for the close monitoring of the lubricant properties. So a little bit above and beyond some of the basic stuff that we talked about, but enough information that we can utilize this to plan and schedule downtime. Uh, you know, it, it's definitely better um, from, from a cost standpoint and from a production standpoint if we can get that repair made while the line is down instead of waiting for the line to shut down, uh, especially in a production process, you know, because do we want to be putting out fires or we want to make repairs ahead of time? How much is your, does your downtime actually cost you? You know, it's above and beyond just the labor and the materials because when you're, if you're talking about a manufacturing setting, we're also having that loss of production. You know, we can't sell products that we can't manufacture. We can also take that same information to extend oil drains. You know, um, if we're on a set calendar schedule where we're changing oil every three months, um, you know, sometimes that oil is still within specifications. This is why we're looking at the lubrication properties. You know, as long as those properties are within spec, we can extend that oil drain out for another three months or for another six months or for even a year. In fact, there are some studies out there that show that a lubricant, if it's properly maintained, it can stay in service for up to 10 years, but you need to make sure it's being properly monitored and that it's within specification. We can also take that oil analysis information to do some root cause failure analysis and, and use that to possibly maybe re-engineer what we're doing at the plant level. If we see through this oil analysis that a specific make and model of gearbox has more issues than say another make and model of gearbox, if we can do some type of redesign the next time when those gearboxes fails, we can replace it with a more reliable gearbox and then possibly engineer out some of the failures that could occur. Now when we get into predictive maintenance, um, this is going to require again some more advanced testing that's now going to focus on the component health. So we've done some condition based where we're focusing on lubricant health. Now we're moving that along to the component itself. Um, this is going to, we're also going to use, utilize some failure modes, additional data analysis, and some statistical analysis to properly trend the oil analysis results and use, utilize it to predict failure. You know, if we can correlate failure modes to the data analysis, we can just advance our program that much further. And this is beneficial in determining the most reliable component, make and model for the specific application. This, this again goes back to having the, the right make and model of that gearbox, you know, having the more reliable one for the application. And of course this itself also relates up, upstream to the root cause analysis. And that's taking this data and determining the reason behind specific failures and removing them if possible. Again, the goal is to you know, eliminate the root cause and prevention of the failure reoccurring. Um, and oil analysis allows you to do this by having the right type of test packaging and, and utilizing that data and correlating it. You can engineer out the root, you know, the root causes and extend that component life overall. All right, so I'm just going to kind of summarize some of the things that we talked about. Uh, again, uh, just to reiterate, you know, oil analysis has it's come a long way in the last 70 years. Started out in the railroad industry, 
uh, the military picked up on it. It's gone from just looking at wear metals to looking at a whole spectrum of things, the lubricant properties, the component properties, and the contamination. It's going to monitor the equipment. It's going to monitor the lubricant. It's going to monitor any type of environmental issues that can be experienced. Basic tests are required, but the, those basic tests are going to be dependent on the component, the application, and depending, depending on what those are, there could be some additional tests required. It can be very accurate, and the more information that's provided in association with that sample, the more high quality of an interpretation you're going to get. Because obviously, you know, having a viscosity result that we know it's an ISO 32 and it's in spec, that doesn't really tell you a whole lot. Knowing that the iron is at 10 parts per million doesn't tell you a lot unless you know what the component belong, the component is and what that information is coming from. Having this information can take that maintenance program to the next level. It can just bump it up a notch to where we're not just putting out fires because of failure, but we're planning for those failures and making the repairs before they occur. 